Today, we're very fortunate to have a special guest. And uh, this was very last minute. That's why we didn't get to do much publicity. Uh, she just happened to be in town um, interviewing some of the Japanese Canadians that are in the Bay Area. And uh, she, we, were, we were fortunate enough to uh, have her come and visit our museum. I spent the day with her. She's got um, a lot of amazing stories about Japanese Canadi Canadians and the differences and similarities. So uh, we're going to get right into our program. And this is, uh, let's give a nice, warm San Jose welcome to uh, Carolyn Nakagawa. here, which I've entitled Japanese Canadians 1877 to present a brief overview. Uh, I'm attempting to condense a lot of information and give you a general sense of what happened in Canada to Japanese Canadians. But I'll pause <coughs> at different points so that you can ask questions and there's lots more detail that I can go into on various aspects. So please keep that in mind as I am talking. Uh, this first image, I'll just explain to you, uh, was taken in 1939. This is Powell Street in Vancouver, which was the center of our little Tokyo, the largest uh, Japanese Canadian community before the war. 1939, the reason I can date it clearly is because this is the royal visit when the King of England, King George, <coughs> visited Vancouver. And you'll see on the left side there is a banner that says GR for George Rex. So I thought this was a suitable image to start off the presentation because it's both very Canadian in terms of what it meant to be Canadian in the 1930s, which was to be a colony of England. Uh, you'll see the Union Jack was actually our flag at the time. And the Japanese Canadians really took this as an opportunity to show their patriotism for Canada uh, by coming out in their traditional dress to greet the king and queen. So that's what that flow is there. Uh, it's customary where I'm from to start off the presentation by acknowledging the indigenous territory that we stand on. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here in San Jose. I did a little bit of internet research and I understand that it's traditional territory of the Muekma Ohlone tribe and I hope I pronounced that somewhat correctly. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here and hosted in your Japan town in the traditional territory of that tribe. Uh, where I come from, uh, the west coast of British Columbia is uh, where most of the Japanese Canadians originally settled when they immigrated from Japan. It's also the traditional territory of a number of indigenous nations, which we collectively call the Coast Salish First Nations. There's a number of them. And the Vancouver area where I live is traditional territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil peoples. So I always thank them for uh, a lot being allowed to live on their territory. And that's where Japanese Canadians uh, originally came to Canada as well. Early immigration. So the first Japanese immigrant to Canada that we can trace definitively is Manzo Nagano. Uh, he has been dated to come to Canada as early as 1877. So that's what we really take as the birth year of Japanese Canadians as a community. And he arrived in New Westminster, which was a port city. And uh, also, was a, he was a merchant. He went back and forth many times. And he actually died in Japan. Um, but he becomes a very important figure for our community as sort of the first <coughs> Japanese Canadian. And his descendants are actually living in California, I believe. Um, but another early immigrant who's very important to the Japanese Canadians is Tomikichi Honma. Tomikichi Honma uh, immigrated from Chibaken in Japan uh, at the age of 18. And he got very involved in the fishing community. There were many Japanese Canadian fishermen. And in order to be a fisherman in Canada, to have a fishing license, you had to become a naturalized British subject. So we use the word citizen because that's the way that we understand these things now, but technically Canadian citizenship didn't exist until 1947. So what happened was uh, immigrants could become naturalized as a British subject. They were a subject of the British Empire. Um, that becomes an interesting dynamic. So Tomokichi Homa, uh, well from the fishing community, becomes a naturalized British subject. And he is the person who ends up taking a court case to ask for the right to vote. So he's, he's a citizen of Canada in all effects. That's what that is at the time. But there's also a law in British Columbia that says uh, no, uh, no one of Chinese or Japanese or Indian origin is allowed to vote. 
Um, and Tomokichi Homa uh, is a rather educated person who comes from an edu educated background and realizes that this is wrong. He's a citizen. He should have the same rights as other citizens. And so he asked to have his name put on the voters list. He's turned down, so he takes his case to court. Um, and it actually goes to the Supreme Court of British Columbia, and they rule in his favor and say, that's correct, you should have the same rights as other citizens. It goes, then the government of BC takes it to the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Supreme Court of Canada agrees, says Tomikichi Homa and other Japanese Canadians who have become naturalized British subjects have the right to vote. And the government of BC appeals it again, and the body that overrides the Supreme Court of Canada is actually the Privy Council in England. And they are the ones who rule and say that the province does have the right to make this distinction based on race. So here we have a couple of pictures, and this is where I'll also pause for questions. Um, on the left, this is Manzo Nagano in the center and his family, taken in Victoria, BC. On the right, is Tomokichi Homa and his family in West Vancouver. And this in the center is the anti-Asian race riots in Vancouver, which occurred in 1907. Uh, some white union activists were uh, reacting to tensions, economic tensions between Japanese immigrant workers and Chinese immigrant workers and white union workers and damaged a great deal of property in Chinatown and Japantown. Uh, so I'll pause for questions here. Anyone has any? How large did the population get uh, by the time you know, he fought for that citizenship right to be able to vote? You know, I don't know the number at that time. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I can't say the uh, exact number. By 1942, there were roughly 22,000 Japanese Canadians, and that included. Uh, the generation that was born in Canada, as well as Japanese nationals and immigrants who had become naturalized. At, in 1902, I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the law against Japanese Canadians voting was actually a reaction to an increase in population. Because originally, when the law was passed, it excluded Chinese Canadians from voting. Mm -hmm. And it was revised a few years later to include Japanese and Indians. What about property rights? Yes, Japanese Canadians could own property. Naturalized? Yes. Uh, I think also nationals, as far as I know. <coughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. How did the uh, English Privy Council vote on uh, his ability to vote? Right, so I'm not a legal scholar, so there's probably more detailed ways to explain this, but because Canada was a colony of Britain at the time, and still is part of the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. uh, at that time, England could overrule legal decisions um, in Canada. And actually, I think in Maine still can, in certain circumstances. So uh, anything where the Supreme Court of Canada made a decision, that decision was appealed in England. And what was the outcome? So in England, they decided that British Columbia did have the authority to exclude certain people from their voters list, and that meant that Asian Canadians could not vote. Asian Canadians. And this uh, restriction was actually only in BC, but it, it extended to the federal <coughs> franchise because the national uh, elections would take the provincial voters lists as their voters lists. Um, but 95% of the population of Japanese Canadians lived in BC, <coughs> so there were only a few hundred, really, who were living outside of BC at the time, and they could vote, but they were a very small number. So what age could they vote? Uh, I believe it was, it might have been 21 at one point, but I think it was 18 for most 18. of that, but it, it was moved for Japanese Canadians. Yeah. So I'll move on. Uh, as I mentioned, the anti-Asian race riots uh, were an explosion of racial tensions in Vancouver, uh, and that led to some immigration restrictions. Now, Canada had some problems restricting immigrants from Japan because Canada was part of Britain, and Britain and Japan were very close diplomatically. They were close friends, imperial allies. So whereas the, Canada did impose a head tax on Chinese immigrants uh, to try and deter immigration from China, 
but that was seen as too insulting to do for Japanese immigrants because they were supposed to be friends with the Japanese uh, empire. So the British and the Japanese came up with an agreement called the Gentlemen's Agreement where Japan agreed that they would restrict Japanese emigrants from leaving Japan for Canada to 400 per year, um, but they did allow families to join immigrants who were already in Canada, which enabled a loophole that allowed a lot of picture brides to join husbands in Canada. And I believe something <coughs> similar happened in the United States. Um, in 1916, during the First World War, uh, <laughs> over 200 Japanese Canadian men uh, decided that they wanted to serve their adopted country of Canada in the First World War. So they uh, actually collectively trained as a corps, as volunteers, in Little Tokyo, they gathered a group together and offered their services as a battalion. Um, but there was political reasons why the government did not want to accept them, mainly the fact that they could see that a group of men who were going to uh, sacrifice their lives for their country was probably also going to ask for the right to vote. So they were turned down, and the corps disbanded, but one by one, each of these men took the train from BC to Alberta, next province over, and enlisted as individuals where they were accepted. And from 1916 onwards, these men were spread out across different battalions, and Japanese Canadian battalions, or the battalions of Japanese Canadians in them, were involved in every major conflict in the First World War after they ended up overseas. Um, but they didn't get the franchise. When they got back, they asked for it if they were turned down until 1931, they finally won the franchise for Japanese Canadian veterans only, not for their community or for their descendants. Uh, 1936 was another important year because by that time, the Canadian-born generation of Japanese Canadians was coming of age, and they sent their own delegation of four exemplary Nisei uh, to Ottawa, the national capital, to argue that they should have the right to the franchise. So here's some pictures. On the left is a Japanese Canadian picture bride. Uh, the center is uh, the Japanese Canadian War Memorial in Stanley Park in Vancouver. It was erected in 1920 in commemoration of those who sacrificed their lives for uh, Canada and the British Empire. And the picture on the right is the delegation of four to Ottawa in 1936, all born in Canada. Um, the woman there is Hide Hyodo. She was the first Japanese Canadian teacher to teach in a public school in BC. Many young women trained as teachers, Japanese Canadian young women, but they mostly were not hired by various schools. Hide Hyodo ended up getting a job in Steeston, which was a very um, one of the centers of Japanese Canadian populations. It was a fishing community. And the person who had worked there before uh, in the kindergarten had gotten frustrated that none of her students spoke English. So they hired Hide Hyodo because they thought she'll speak Japanese to the children, but she actually didn't speak Japanese. <laughs> um, the other people um, on the steps with her are um, Edward Banno, who was a dentist, um, Minoru Kobayashi was an insurance agent, and Samuel Hayakawa was actually an academic living in the United States, and I think he went on to become a United States senator. <coughs> yeah. So he, he actually was living in the United States at the time and traveled up to join this delegation and argue for the rights of Japanese Canadians. <coughs> Any questions at this time? How the, since he lived in the, in the States, how was he allowed to go up there to fight for the rights of the Canadian okay. Japanese? So good question. He was Japanese Canadian. He grew up in Canada. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about the logistics of border crossings at that time. Um, oh, and the outcome of that delegation was that the special parliamentary committee that heard them was very impressed because they <laughs> spoke perfect English. They were shocked. Um, but ultimately, they went away and thought about it, and they listened to their colleagues who were politicians from BC who said very racist things and ended up not granting them the franchise, despite the very successful presentation. Yes? Uh, sounds like um, the Japanese Americans there could get a good education, but but uh, Canadians. Uh, but by and large, what kind of uh, work did the um, most of the population do there? So the Issei who first immigrated, the major industries that they were involved in were fishing as well as farming, um, mining, and logging. 
so very resource intensive industries. Uh, and then, of course, as communities started to pop up, there were more merchants, um, and they really worked hard to try and better their children's lives. So Japanese Canadians, even though they had a lot of barriers economically and culturally, they actually attended university at the same rate as the white population. Um, but there were a lot of barriers to actually getting employment in white collar jobs afterwards. Some of them were explicit because actually in order to enter certain professions such as law, such as pharmacy, you had to be on the voters list. And of course Japanese Canadians weren't on the voters list. This includes people born in Canada. They were not allowed to be on the voters list. So they couldn't join certain professions. Others were more implicit that um, put teachers and journalists, um, there was just a bar against the willingness to hire Japanese Canadians in those jobs. If, um, of obviously for the amount of years that the population had been there, um, they were exposed also to some of the nationals there. Was there any documentation as far as interracial marriage and how that impacted the families? It's a great question. Um, there were some interracial marriages, but they were extremely rare. And because they were so rare, we actually don't know a lot about them in detail. Well, another industry that uh, the second generation as well were very involved in was um, sewing. A lot of the women uh, would open their own sewing shops and dressmaking tailor shops, and also working in the canneries alongside the men who were fishing. So, the Second World War is where we often concentrate a lot of our talk about uh, Nikkei history. Uh, 1931, Canada enters the war in Europe alongside Britain, and they invoke something called the War Measures Act. And that becomes important for Japanese Canadians later. It's basically a way that they're able to have martial law and pass a lot of what are called orders and councils without going through the regular democratic process to have basically <coughs> laws that don't have the same checks and balances as laws. And orders and council could not be challenged in court, which is important. Uh, in 1941, people of deaf Japanese ancestry are very aware of the rising sentiment against Japanese Canadians, not only just general racist sentiment, um, economic competition and resentment over that, but also because of the awareness of Japanese army and their actions in China. Um, there's a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment. And of course, people are seeing the, the war with Japan coming. So Japanese Canadians voluntarily, by and large, they do voluntarily register with the federal government to show that they have nothing to hide. Uh, December of 1941, after Japan's attacks on Pearl Harbor and Hong Kong, Canada declares war on Japan, and Japanese fishing boats are seized by the government, uh, roughly 1,200 of them, almost immediately. The other two things that happen immediately are language schools are shut down, as well as the Japanese language newspapers. And then, similar to what happened in the United States, um, there's an order in council passed in February 1942, which says that uh, Japanese Canadians cannot be within 100 miles of the west coast of BC. And again, this is where about 95% of Japanese Canadians are living at the time. Originally, they think it's going to be only the Japanese nationals, perhaps just the men of a certain able-bodied age. Then they learn fairly quickly that it's going to be everyone, including Canadian citizens, Canadian born. Uh, on the left are our registration cards. I actually don't know. Did Japanese <coughs> Americans have registration cards? <coughs> so these were issued in 1941. So one on the top is yellow. The yellow ones were for Japanese nationals. Uh, the second one is pink for a naturalized Canadian citizen. And the bottom one is white for Canadian born. So there are three categories, but in effect, they were treated the same. Hmm. Um, this was for everyone over the age of 16. It was a first voluntary in 1941. After the war with Japan, it became mandatory in early 42. Uh, that's an example of a notice uh, to enemy aliens, uh, which was the original group they thought were going to be removed from the coast. Then it became everyone. Uh, this photo on the right side is the front page of the New Canadian, which was the only English language Japanese Canadian community newspaper. It was run by some young Nisei. And this is the page that shows the exclusion zone, a map, when they first were discovering what was going to happen. 
So this is when they found out that it was going to be all of the West Coast. And they illustrated that here. And you'll see also that this is one of the early issues where they started to include Japanese translations of their articles. Originally, they didn't, and their staff didn't speak Japanese. But after the shutdown of the Japanese language newspapers, they had to start including Japanese translations for the Issei who didn't know English to keep up with the new regulations. Other questions? Well, <clears throat> if they had to disperse this 100 miles zone, where did they disperse to? I mean, was it up to them to get their own housing? And so at this point, in February 1942, that's the exact same question that they're asking. Uh, the, question, the answer to that question is very unclear. And some people did start to make arrangements to go and find other places to live outside of that zone at this point. Um, but my next slide is actually about where they did go by March. Yes? When they confiscated the boats, where did they take them? They impounded them in New Westminster, which is a harbor, and uh, there's a lot of there was a lot of complaints at the time that um, there were um, people in the Navy who didn't know really much about how to treat boats. They were from the prairies and the boats were very badly treated and they were damaged. So they were just held there by the government in trust. Um, which I'll tell you more about what happens to them later. So where did they go? Um, by and large, they went to government-run internment sites. There were 10 of them in the interior of BC. There were also a few self-supporting sites where there was a bit more freedom and you had to pay your own way there and you had to pay your own rent and all your expenses. So you can imagine that was mostly the wealthier families who set up their own communities and got permission from the government to do that. There is also the sugar beet projects in the prairie provinces east of BC, and that was a system where they were sent to help farmer and farming families in the prairies produce sugar for the war effort. Um, sugar beet farming is backbreaking work, and most families who did it were, often they were farming families, other times they knew nothing about farming, but the incentive for sugar beet farms was that you could go as a family group. Um, if you were in a government-run site, uh, often the men were sent to road camps and separated from their families. Uh, properties, homes, and businesses were held in trust by the government. So if you, had, if you owned your house or if you owned your business, the government said, we will hold it for you um, while you are gone. Um, the body overseeing that was called the custodian of enemy alien property. And road camps in the interior of BC, as well as in Alberta, were set up, and men between the ages of 18 and 45, first Japanese nationals and then as well Canadian citizens, were sent there. That project actually closed down in 1942 for the most part, but it was a very um, important, impactful part of the early internment period. Uh, and then in 1943, um, Ordering Council 469 authorized the sale of Japanese Canadian property without the consent of the owners. Um, so fishing boats, houses, and businesses were all sold at auction. As you can imagine, they didn't get very good prices for those, where there was not a lot of attempt to. And the proceeds for those sales, if you were in a government-run internment camp, it would go into an account, and certain expenses of the cost of your internment were deducted each month from that, and you would get a certain portion of that sent to you for living expenses, which was often insufficient. Um, so you actually, if you had property, you were paying for your own internment. Uh, this is a map of internment sites. Um, can I take it with me? Metro Vancouver was the main urban center for Japanese Canadians, but there were also settlements in Victoria, Vancouver Island, and Eclulet, in Skeena as well, um, all up along the coast, north coast as well. Um, the 100 mile exclusion zone was just near a point called Hope. So uh, the westernmost internment site was a place called Tashi, and it was just past Hope. 
Um, and Tashmi was actually named for the three commissioners of what was called the BC Security Commission. That was the government body that organized internment. The three commissioners were named Taylor, Shearis, and Mead, and they took the first two letters of each of their names to make the name Tashmi. So that was one of the purpose-built sites. It uh, was, was a, a ranch beforehand, and they built uh, tar paper shacks on the site. Uh, it was the largest population of about 2,600 at its peak. Um, but other sites, um, they're mostly in this area called the uh, Slocan Valley. Um, many of them were abandoned mining towns. So uh, where is Caslow was one, as well as Greenwood, which is here. Uh, and those were places where there had been uh, mining deposits and were now ghost towns. So they're very minimal populations of non-Japanese Canadians, and then Japanese Canadians moved into the empty infrastructure there. Um, and the self-supporting tides are over here. Uh, Minto, uh, one of the self-supporting tides, was also a, a ghost town for mining. Um, and the road camps, you see there's several of them scattered throughout, um, basically building highways between BC and Alberta. Questions about this section? Yes? There were in BC. Um, I don't know the details of how that interaction was. There was some talk about using some of the Indian residential schools as internment sites, but that didn't end up going through. Because that happened here. Really? Uh, Posted was on Indian reservations. I see. Uh, no, none of these sites were on Indian reservations. Um, there was some interaction with uh, Duke of populations who were. Um, pacifist minority groups who helped the Japanese Canadians in the interior of BC. Yes? Question uh, in reference to the early history of the uh, Japanese uh, migration into Canada. Where is the port of entry in Canada, or do they go through Seattle? Oh, good question. So, so many of them did sail through the United States and cross over the border by land, but originally the port was Victoria, Victoria. and then later it became Vancouver. Um, no, so, the other question is, do you have a, an idea of where in Japan these immigrants came from? What part of Japan? All over Japan. The four biggest prefectures, let's see if I remember them, were Wakayama, yeah. uh, Shiga, Hiroshima, and I want to say probably Kumamoto. Kumamoto. I think it's the fourth one that was the biggest. Island. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so. Okay, that's very typical of the similar? people that migrated to the United States. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, the, were the road crews formed for the Japanese <coughs> to be part of, or were they already existing? And no, it was exclusively um, basically to get the Japanese Canadian men out of the um, coastal region and onto work projects. Hmm. And they were paid 25 cents an hour to build roads by hand. They had no machinery. Yeah. Is that a question there? Yeah, what were the weather conditions like where they came from? Great question. That was actually something I wanted to add before I move on. So the coast here, very mild climate, rainy but mild. Um, interior, much more harsh. Um, hotter summers, colder winters, snow in the winter, which doesn't really happen on the west coast. So um, the first camp, Greenwood, opened in April 1942. And Tashmi was the last open. It opened in September. All Everyone had to be out by the end of October. Basically, so they gave basically time for winter, and 1942 in BC was the coldest winter on record. They had tons of snow, and they had no way to deal with it. The shacks were not insulated, and they didn't have warm clothing. So there's some horror stories about ice on the, on the inside of the shacks each morning when they woke up. I imagine these being abandoned mining areas, that there wasn't a lot of natural resources really to draw against, even for harvesting or planting or anything else. And also what you're saying about the um, topography of the area it certainly doesn't offer a lot of opportunity also. Yeah, very mountainous terrain. Um, I know in the United States the camps were surrounded by barbed wire fences. There were no barbed wire fences in Canada because you were set in the middle of nowhere BC. And I've been in this terrain, it's very mountainous. So there was really nowhere to go 
Um, there was some gardens that were set up to grow the vegetables in the different camps, but not farming so much. Um, the farming that happened was in the prairies further east. Many of the farming families went to grow sugar beets. What was the population of the camps? So the largest one was Tashni. It was about 2,600 at its peak. Um, i trying to remember if I know any of the other numbers off the top of my head. I think Lemon Creek was about 1,000. So they're much smaller than the American camps, uh, but they vary in size. Yes, in the back corner. Are any of the uh, internment camps uh, preserved for historical purposes? Great question. There is a Nikkei Internment Memorial Center in New Denver. Where's New Denver on the map? New Denver 8, right here. New Denver was also where they had the tuberculosis sanatorium for the TB patients who were Japanese Canadian. Uh, so they have a site where they preserve some of the shacks, um, and that's actually where many of the people who lived in New Denver, New Denver stayed there after the war for decades, so <coughs> they still have those shacks. And even the residents of New Denver, some of them live in renovated shacks now. Um, Tashni recently opened their own small museum uh, in the former butcher shop. There's a couple buildings still standing alone, no actual shacks where people lived. The uh, question about the camps, uh, were they secured camps? with armed guards and all of that? No, no armed guards. The RCMP would check on them. Mm -hmm. And there were <coughs> administrative staff from the BC Security Commission. But mainly it was a matter of where would you go. They were out in remote yeah. areas. Yeah. yeah, and people were receiving permits to go east. If they could find a job east of BC in other provinces, uh, often in domestic labor um, or farming uh, or other, uh, there were also, I think, some other sugar beet camps and things like that, they were allowed to go east if they could find a job, and they were encouraged to do that because uh, a lot of people in these uh, internment camps were on government support. No, were, was housing provided for these folks, or did yes. they have to do? Uh, so the men, a lot of the men who were originally sent to road camps, were later diverted to build the shacks for internment. Okay. Yes. What about military service? Uh, good question. Many young Japanese Canadian men tried to join the Canadian Army starting in 1939. Um, almost all of them were turned away. Uh, there was no explicit policy against it, but only a handful managed to get through. And, uh, people were pretty clear that they probably couldn't join the Army. Um, the pressure started to rise from the allies of Canada to say, we have all these Japanese Canadians and we need translators in our army. Um, so what started to happen was the British army went through and tried to recruit the Nisei from internment camps as translators for the army. And some of them did go. Um, some of them had some very strong words for those people. Um, but actually in terms of all being allowed to join the Canadian army and having the, the doors really open for them, that happened in 1945. And a number of Japanese Canadian men did sign up to join the army at that time. They were recruited as intelligence officers to be translators uh, for Japanese. Um, most of them did speak Japanese. <laughs> so they were sent to a special language school and had to try to learn Japanese. And it was very difficult and it didn't work very well for the most part. Um, and they were sent over the seas after the war. They actually didn't finish their training until after the war had ended. But they were sent overseas to debrief and help with the post-war. Um, interrogation of Japanese prisoners and so on. So you're, uh, what I'm understanding is that there's a difference between the Canadian Army and the British Army. Yes. Is there any connection? At this, at this time there is, and I'm not the person to ask about the details at that time. In the First World War, when the Issei served, um, the Canadian Army was just part of the British Army. At this time there was a difference um, that they had. we had our own army. Um, but they were allied with Britain, and we were actually declared war on our own um, after uh, when England did as well. Uh -huh. But it was an autonomous setup by the 40s. Yes? Carolyn, were there telephone lines that run to these camps, or were they completely isolated? Oh, good question. Telephone lines. We're so used to cell phones. And yeah. Um, I, I, I can't think of. I, I can't think that I've ever heard anyone mention telephone lines. So the New Canadian, the newspaper that I mentioned earlier, was a really important news source. It published out of Caslow, and they sent it out to all around the camps, and they had correspondents who would mail in letters. 
Um, the newspaper was under censorship, um, so they would have to wire all of their content to Vancouver and get back what they couldn't publish. Um, but as far as I know, there weren't any telephone lines. People did lose track of each other quite a lot at this time. Were you allowed cameras? Do you know if cameras were allowed there where they were staying? They were not allowed. Uh, however, we have quite a few pictures taken in the camps. Um, so I think what happened was originally in early 42, radios, cameras, and cars are all confiscated. Um, and anyone who left BC, I think, was their, their car, car camera or radio could be returned to them. Um, although many of those things ended up getting sold along with houses and businesses. So there's, uh, there's a lot of also different uh, government officials who would who were told would look the other way, you know, like don't tell me that you're going to go take pictures, <laughs> don't tell me that you're going fishing, just, just don't do that. But um, they kind of understood the absurdity of the situation and looked the other way in many cases. So we have quite a few photographs, although they weren't technically supposed to have cameras. Mm -hmm. More pictures. Uh, this is Tashmi. In the winter of 42 or early 43, you could see the tar paper shacks are completely covered with snow and frost. Uh, and this is a family working in the sugar beet farms. Um, sugar beets are a really, really terrible crop to have to work on, backbreaking work. Um, one of the stories I've heard about is that you would harvest them after the ground froze because that's when their sugar content would be the highest. So they would have to hack through the frozen ground and then cut off the tops and throw the beets in, uh, hack off all the frozen mud that had clumped around it. And uh, even small children would often be working in the fields uh, all day long. Is that voluntary to go? Yes. So that was an option given to families who wanted to stay together. And at the time, if you went to a government site, your adult men in your family would be often sent to road camps. Uh, so there was a bit more control over how you could maintain your family unit if you went to Sugar Beets. You might be able to keep your extended family with you rather than just your nuclear family. Um, so this was a good option for families who had grown sons. Often they would go to keep their sons with them. Were they paid wages like you mentioned, 25 cents an hour, is that? Uh, yes, they were paid wages. The wages were very low, and I can't recall what they were off the top of my head, but I know that it was, um, I think, based on the acre, and uh, many families talk about not having enough to make it through the winter based on those wages, even though they were working uh, dawn to dusk every day during the season. Yes? Was there medical care provided for these people? Mm, good question. That's another one where um, the, the situation is not always clear. There were doctors in the camps. The doctors were carefully distributed among different camps. Who were Japanese Canadian. Um, sugar beets, not really. Uh, I had heard one story of uh, if you were outside of an internment camp, you needed an RCMP permit to travel, I think, more than 20 miles outside of your regular place of residence. If you're working on a farm, the nearest hospital is more than 20 miles away. So there was one uh, family who, they had a sick daughter and they couldn't go to the hospital because they needed a permit and you needed to get a permit weeks in advance. And um, there's lots of stories about people fearing for their young siblings who are sick and almost die. Hmm. What about the fatality rate? How many people die? There needs to be more research done on that. Yeah, um, definitely um, Hastings Park, where um, many of the people, for, especially from the outlying areas, were collected in Vancouver. That's our fairground. Um, they were collected there before getting sent to the internment sites. Uh, it was very, very crowded and unsanitary conditions, people living in the livestock building. Um, and that was also, they had a TB hospital there. For patients that already had tuberculosis, others contracted it when they were at Hastings Park. So there are definitely fatalities caused by situations like that, caused by living in insufficient housing, I'm sure. Um, but we don't have conclusive numbers on that. So uh, if there are no other questions for now, I'll go on to post-war or late, late war period. <coughs> 
1945, I believe, by this time Japanese Americans are getting sent home. Early 1945, uh, the war, end of the war is in sight. Japanese Canadians who are living in BC are surveyed and they're asked, would you like to go to Japan after the war? The term they used was repatriation, although that included the Japanese Canadians who were born in Canada and had never been to Japan. Um, over 10,000 signed to go to Japan after the war, saying they would like to go to Japan after the war. Uh, the others are told, if you don't sign, um, you should settle east of the Rockies because the government has a policy of dispersal towards Japanese Canadians. They don't want them settling in groups. So you should leave BC um, to show that you are cooperating with the government policy and you will be subject, most likely, to a loyalty tribunal which will determine whether or not you are loyal to Canada, whether or not you cooperate with the government. And um, there is this threat looming over that if you don't sign to go voluntarily, with your passage to Japan paid, you might be sent involuntarily later if you fail the loyalty tribunal. Um, so the deportation plan gets quashed really in 1946-1947. Uh, there's a public outcry against deporting Canadian citizens, thank goodness. Um, so mandatory deportation doesn't happen because it's held up in the courts, but approximately 4,000 Japanese Canadians actually do sail to Japan at that time. Um, there's also a legal commission called the Bird Commission, which is set up to provide compensation for uh, loss of property, but it's, the terms are very limited. So the government doesn't admit fault or responsibility for anything that happened, including the forced sale. Um, they define very narrow terms for what they consider to be valid um, grounds.